Now, against all the odds, um, even throughout 2009, when the market in Europe was dead, the China market for modern and contemporary art continued to rise. So you invest, if you'd invested, even in 2008 in Chinese art, in the modern or the contemporary market, you'd still have made a profit. Now, no other market in the West, not even old masters, kept its value through 2009, 2010. That's a sign that the China market is going in a different direction to the European and American markets. And this is a good example. This is an artist extremely famous in China, Zhang Xiaogang. He was part of the political pop movement in China. And this piece, which was brought together as a triptych, like a triptych, three in, three in a row, um, just like that piece over there, which is heavily undervalued, I think. Um, <laughs> This piece here made a record for the artist. I mean, in, I tell you, I could have bought his, no, kill myself. I could have bought this work in 1998 for about 20, not this particular one, but this artist, for about $20,000 for a, a major canvas. And this piece here now sold in 2011 as a triptych for 9 million US. So yeah, I know I wouldn't be standing here, I can assure you. I would be somewhere, <laughs> I'd be in Marbella probably. <laughs> and I'd be listening to somebody else tell me uh, what to do. So um, that's a tragedy. So um, anyway, this is what happened. This piece was actually lost and then it was brought together so it had an, an added value. But still, you know, he's not a particularly old artist. He's continuing to, to rise and, uh, and I think that's a good sign. Yeah. And this is the sort of art I'm looking at now. It uh, may not seem very interesting to you on the surface, but actually it's quite, it's quite intelligent. It's on silk and it is uh, brush painting, a landscape sort of probably a Sung Dynasty or a Tang Dynasty, it's probably Sung equivalent. Um, contemporary artist, quite young, uh, very young, N86. Um, but it's made with Coca-Cola. Uh, it's made with um, melted down Coca-Cola. So it's a bit like the pop art across the wall there, but it's much more subtle. And again, it's the return to the medium of the brush, return to the natural materials. And I think artists like this, and there are many in China who are very good now, are, this is the new movement. And it's very affordable, and it's out there, actually. It's out there if you're interested. Um, now, uh, since it's a photography exhibition downstairs, I couldn't not talk about Chinese photography. It's the one element of Chinese art which is, I think, um, not traditional, obviously, but is fascinating because it records a changing China. And that's the thing. Emerging markets, documentary photography, obviously, people will want to know what was before. And I think that's why this picture is so interesting. And so, and Weng Feng is just a, is a classic example. Some a little child, this, this is the past, looking over a wall into the future. So this sort of work, it, it, you know, it has a resonance with, the, with a Chinese audience. You must always think, what, where is the resale market? It's going to be in Asia, isn't it? It's not going to be amongst Europeans anymore or Americans. There will be a resale market in China. I think this sort of work will catch people's attention. Yang Fu Dong, probably the most famous of the new artists in China. He's actually a filmmaker, essentially, but he does still photography as well. And he, again, again, he's playing with the theme of being lost in the new world. Here's the intellectual with a brick, not knowing where to throw it, um, isolated in a new city, which he doesn't even know the names of the streets. I mean, you go to Shanghai in one month, the next month you come back and all the street names have changed because the city's changed. And that's the sort of confusion. So again, he's an important artist historically. And I think he, he will continue to do very, very well um, in the resale market. Um, Chao Fei, another very famous female, this time a female photographer. Um, she basically concentrates on the dislocation between traditional, the father, and I mean, it must be terribly shocking for Chinese parents. I mean, I imagine, you know, here's, I mean, in the West as well, but particularly for Chinese parents. I mean, they've gone from basically being a socialist um, state-run government to being um, people, you know, becoming basically total consumers. So <laughs> she examines this whole area of the change in consumer behavior and social behavior in China. Important again. Um, and actually, downstairs, there is a um, Chiu, uh, Chiu Xiu Yuan. Um, this is a, a forbidden city, obviously, and we have... We have a dispute about what she's trying to represent. I thought she was trying to represent um, um, homosexuality in China, but clearly uh, there's a disagreement there. But she plays with taboos. She plays with um, all kinds of taboos, shall we say. And again, you know, a significant artist in the 
photographic world in China and I think a collectible future artist. Just one thing, when you, when you buy photographs, always make sure the edition is not too large. This is six. That would be about right, you know, 10 is about okay. Anything more than sort of 15, 20, you get a bit nervous. It's called inflation, photographic inflation. Okay, another, another guy, Fen Ma, um, you know, again, taboos, nudity in China is still a difficult subject. Um, and so obviously he um, is um, confronting these taboos. Not just China, but also in Taiwan. Now, Taiwan's a funny one. The market for, for art in Taiwan is very interesting at the moment, and you could look for a niche market in Taiwan. Um, this is an, uh, an artist called Chen Chi Chang, born in Taiwan, as I said, in Tainan in the south. And he has spent um, 20 or so years going to this temple in, in the southern part of Tainan to look at um, inmates who are tied together. Now, it's not meant to be for cruel reasons. They're tied together because one of them is meant to be slightly more sane than the other. And so, in a sense, they try to correct the behavior of the, of the less fortunate one. So, it's actually, it's quite a sympathetic uh, photograph. But this work and these works, this series and this series, which shows double happiness, um, basically Taiwanese men marrying Vietnamese women to get pu to, uh, for, for wives, basically, because they haven't got any wives in Taiwan who will marry them. Um, is another of these social documentary issues, which I think will be, you know, interesting for the future. But um, anyway, quickly, South America, not really my area, to be honest, but there are obviously markets to look at there. Mexican art is by far the largest um, of, the, of the markets, which is dealt in internationally. Um, and the sales are fairly reasonable, but they're not huge. What Although the, the fall in 2008 for South American art was smaller than other emerging markets, so I don't know what that tells you that it's slightly less risky, perhaps. I don't know. Alice. And the biggest name is Vic Muniz. Um, he appears in a number of very major shows all over the world um, and tends to make um, copies, pastiche, of famous works of art using photography. Yeah. India, very quick in South America, sorry. Uh, India... Um, Again, the Indian market is very interesting. Again, it declined dramatically in 2008. All markets did, but has shown some recovery um, in 2010. Yeah. And this is something called the Confidence Index. Now, this is a, a, web, a, a fairly good um, website. Basically, the, he interviews major collectors in the field, and the confidence, therefore, reflects the future performance of the market to some extent. Yeah, okay, and here's an example. MF Hussein, actually, he died a few weeks, so this is good news in many ways. Well, he was very, he was relatively old. I mean, he was not a tragedy. So his prices will, I think, really escalate now, and they must do. The problem with Hussein is, like a lot of artists who live a long time, they make a lot of work. And the last part of their work is usually not that interesting. So again, this is a warning, you know, be careful which part of an artist's, you know, um, creative period you buy into. I mean, late Picassos are notoriously poor. Um, so, you know, it's not always as simple as just buying an Hussein. You have to buy the right Hussein, and that's when you have to be quite technical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rashid Rana, another, another artist who works for photography. This looks like a, a Persian or Afghan carpet, but actually you look around the other, you go one side, it's a carpet, the other side, it's a slaughterhouse. So you have these two images going on here. I know it's not, not very pleasant, but he, again, he works with the same technique, the same company as some of the, the um, Chinese photographers. It's made in Dusseldorf, so... It has a German stamp on it, but like a Mercedes. So um, anyway, he, I, well, he is doing very, very well, actually. I'm not a great fan of his work, but um, his market is very strong and shows that Indian market for this sort of work is quite strong. Iran and the Middle East, I mean, it's politics all the way. Um, so I'll be careful what I say. Golnaz Fati um, is an example of someone who's what we call um, abstract calligraphy. That's the other area you might be interested in. It happens in China. And also in the Arab world, obviously, with Arabic script, you get a, a, a movement which is it's called sakakana. It basically means um, drinking fountain, but it, it, it revolves around calligraphy and, and going back in history. So these new Arab, Arabic calligraphers are, are very, very interesting, and the market is loving it, absolutely loving it. There was a Sotheby's sale in Doha called Haruf, which sold out everything to Arabic collectors, actually, mainly Middle Eastern collectors. So, yeah. Así que. Um, I'm nearly, nearly finished, so um, please stay. <laughs> this is Dior Azawi. It's called Blessed Tigress. It's actually a sculpture. It was in the British Museum. Um, I think it's 
wasn't bought by the British Museum, so I think it may be on the market, actually. Anyway, I don't know. But look at it. It's, it's a giant thing. It was two meters, six meters high. Um, it's a sculpture. It's beautiful. It's got a little bit of um, fr um, sort of in fretwork there. And it's based on the spiral minaret in Iraq, in Samara. And again, not calligraphy, but going back and looking at architectural, um, in this case, architecture in um, Mesopotamia, Iraq. OK, I think that, that's all you can stand, because um, we will, otherwise you will die. I know. The rest, actually, it's pretty good. This rest of it, it's all in the book. I mean, this is um, Southeast Asia. Now, the only thing I'd say about Southeast Asia is huge amounts of volatility and risk um, in all the images here, but very, very, very reasonable. So if you want to go shopping, it's like a Walmart experience, go to South America, and you go to Southeast Asia, you'll find a lot of work. Vietnam, Indonesia, um, and Malaysia, probably are the three, and Thailand, are the three Southeast Asian states. Um, but, I mean, it's all in the book. I mean, it's all in the book. Come on. <laughs> Bueno, muchas gracias por vuestra asistencia.